Thanks, guys, for coming. Uh, we are at debate number two of the Webby Debate Series. I am Lori Siegel from CNN Money. Joining me today, we have Paul Carr. Paul is a columnist from TechCrunch and a former writer of The Guardian. Paul recently went on a self-described social shutdown, quitting Facebook, Foursquare, LinkedIn, lots of other social media services. So this should go very well with our debate as to whether social media is overrated. Um, Paul, you actually once wrote, there's more to life than feeding the insatiable blood-eating plant of social media. So we, were, we are very happy to hear your thoughts on that. Big words. I'm sure I did. <laughs> <laughs> and also joining us, Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, Gary, you're an avid social media user, host of Wine Library TV. You very much use social media to build your brand. Um, Wine Library TV now has over 90,000 viewers daily. Um, and it's one of the most downloaded podcasts on iTunes in the food category. So guys, thanks for joining us. I just want to start kind of to set it up. Um, Paul, was there an actual instance that you realized the lack of value in social media? Uh, well, it's not a lack of value. It's, it's, it's that it wasn't for me. I decided that um, when I, I, I came to write a book, and I write basically about myself. I'm a huge egotist. Um, <laughs> so you'd think social media would be good for me. But I actually, um, I wrote a, my first book a couple of years ago, and I used I looked back at like all my previous blog posts and things, um, sort of more long form stuff, columns I'd written and things like that, and I was really pleased when I wrote the first book to find I had lots of sort of reminders of things I'd done and stories about you know adventures I'd had. Fast forward to the second book, the sort of follow up, and um, in the interim I joined Twitter and I looked back again and thought, oh, I'll have even more this time because I'll have every single detail of my life, and I found I had nothing. I found all I'd said was. And, and everyone dismisses social media with the cliche of oh, all I had for breakfast. And it wasn't that. It was just all I had was these sort of contextless, inane sort of overheards and retweets and things that didn't. I looked at stuff and thought, I have no idea what I've done for the last two years. Unfortunately, I kept other notes. But it suddenly occurred to me, all this stuff we're putting out there, there's a question of whether anyone's listening. But there's also a question of whether we're actually saying anything. And, and it was at that point that I thought, as someone who you know, egotistically writes about himself, this is actually destructive to me. This is, I'm writing less, even though I'm actually churning out more. So I guess that was it. Uh, Gary, on the flip side, yeah. uh, what, what would you say made you real? was there a specific circumstance, something that actually made you realize the value in social media? Well, I, I think what Paul's saying is right. I, you know, as somebody also who enjoys his ego tremendously, um, I think that's probably the best thing about social media. I think the way to win in social media or have success is to not talk but to listen. You know, if you, you know, there is probably not many better or more often self-promoters within social media than I am, but I have a lot of street cred because if you go and look at my interactions, you know, I'm in the 95 percentile of just at replying and responding. And so I think for two guys that are fond of their egos, you, you, I think it's not as valuable for us as prior mediums or other opportunities. It's the listening part that made sense to me. I mean, I built my brand by using Semize.com, which eventually got bought by Twitter and is the back of their search engine. Nobody knew who I was. I wasn't going to be Robert Parker, Wine Spectator, and have those platforms. So all I did was search Chardonnay and Merlot and Pinot Grigio, and, and, and I just started answering questions. I became useful. And I think that uh, that's when I started realizing the power when I started using Semize. Okay, let's, you know, you guys, you talk a lot about at replies and, yep. and that kind of thing. So let's kind of move towards Twitter because social okay. media, there are a lot of different parts sure. of it. Um, Paul, how valuable would you say Twitter is as, as a tool of social media? You capped your account at 10,000 so people yeah. can't follow you anymore. Well, and I've, and I've in fact deleted those since. So I, I've, I'm now not on Twitter at all. I, I re-registered the account so that no one else could steal it and pretend to be me. But, but I have zero followers. They're all, That's going to be my move. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, could, I just thought, oh, okay, Gary. He's amazing. I know. <laughs> Uh, he's encouraged me to get back on Twitter. I'm crushing it. Um, <laughs> no, I. Um, so actually, in, in, I agree with the people who say if you're not using Twitter and if you're ignoring Twitter, you're an idiot as a marketer. However, that's the trouble is when you start to say it's valuable for other things, and there's this sort of obsession with it's changing the world, and that's where it, we go into the realms of overrated. People say. Oh, I um, I changed my avatar to green. Thus, I've I've helped revolution <laughs> in Iran. People say, Oh, I retweeted this thing from you know this company, IBM, and now they're going to give five cents to cure cancer. So I don't need to do anything else this month. I've cured cancer. And you know, and to Gary's point about you know listening is the key. I agree. Except n most people aren't listening. Most people are just shouting and shouting and shouting. And the trouble when everyone's shouting is that no one's listening. And 
and you end up with this, and no one's considering or discussing or debating, and you, you end up with this thing where if somebody puts something out there, somebody makes a bold statement on Twitter, especially if it's kind of catchy, especially if it rhymes, um, <laughs> then people just blindly retweet. No one thinks, wait a minute, what do I think about this, or is this true? They're just like, Ugh. you know, and they sort of just hit the, hit the retweet with their fist, and that's like, that's, it's done. And the idea that that's valuable is, I mean, is ridiculous. So I guess it depends what you're saying you're using it for and how you're using it, but generally speaking for most people, I think it's destructive rather than constructive. What Paul's talking about is, is very valid. My argument or debate to try to at least give you guys some value, otherwise we're gonna start you know, French kissing here in a yeah. minute, <laughs> um, is that that's what traditional media did from afar to me in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, it's the same old game, right? I mean, we could sit here and talk about this left and right. The fact of the matter is, is it comes down to the individuals. Some people know how to do it, some don't. And I think that you know, there's just a vast majority of people now who can be storytellers or DJs aggregating all this stuff that's going on out there. I think traditional media a lot of times just pounded the retweet button in the past as well. Something came across the you know, AP and they would you know, kind of do it. I mean, you think about the old nightly news. I didn't need them to tell me that Tiger Woods won the US Open. We, they show the highlight and then the cheesy sportscaster's like, and yeah. And that's kind of just like what I see from social as well. I agree. Do you think, I think that it's getting to a point where there's so much noise that it's tough to map that social graph a bit? Well, I, I, think, I think it's strange that like Facebook has managed to very cleverly become synonymous with your actual friends. Like that, that whole, we're going to miss you. It's like, no, you're not. You're sitting right here. <laughs> and it's like, no, on this screen, we're going to miss you. It's, it's so messed up. And I think there's, there is actually a, a strange difference. And it's, it's sort of generational as well, where people like Gary and I, who sort of came into the internet before Facebook, see, you know, you mentioned like catching up with old friends and like all this idea. People who are coming into Facebook now never had the idea of ever losing touch with old friends. Like, yeah. to them, it is synonymous with their social graph. And in fact, there are a lot of yeah. friends who they've never met. And that's, what's, that's what, to me, is slightly strange about Facebook and is, is potentially really interesting but potentially really damaging to social relationships is this idea that, oh, because I've, like, poached them on Facebook this week, I've had my interaction. On the flip side, I feel like that's a human being that I might have had double zero. You know, Robert Parrish like interaction with my whole life. And so maybe just that little something means something. To me, you know, when I open the door for somebody and, and they, you know, in the city and they walk through, if they turn back and give me a smile instead of just walking through, that changes the whole complexity of like the way I feel. And I just wonder, I wonder if that's what's being replicated. And some way, I'll be honest with you, I think this stuff is making it more scalable, not less scalable as a lot of people think. When you talk about being more social, would you say, and this goes to kind of both of you guys, that when you say you're being more social, are you really kind of missing out on these real relationships? Whereas Paul might have a little bit more time now yeah. that he's put, he's almost less social to be more social with some, you know, some of these more real relationships. Do you think well, that- I'm talking about this creation of virtual relationships. And I think, you, I, again, I think it's a generational thing. I do worry, maybe I'm getting old, but I do worry like in 30 years, will, ha will there be as many of those good firm friendships that are based on real world interaction? Or will people just have so many like, micro reactions that they sort of added them all together and consider that to be a their group of friends and, and that's what I'm talking about it's not yet I, don't I, I love this guy a lot and respect him Thanks, a lot Karen. but I truly feel like there was somebody how many ever years ago saying the same thing he was saying about the telephone I mean people were freaking I mean you know history tells us the future in a lot of ways I mean people were like oh you know people are always arguing about we're not going to meet face to face because we're going to be on the telephone I, look, now I, I right? agree with, no but the thing is and I and I dislike those people you know I'm definitely not a Luddite <laughs> I, I, I imagine if I met them uh, <laughs> I wouldn't Facebook friend them. Um, <laughs> but, I, and I, but I agree with you, I think technology is great. I think people, I think a better analogy is uh, 10 years ago people were saying it about reality TV and they were right. This idea of these vacuous, you know, this, this idea of, I mean you say in your book about the idea of, you know, you, you should be your own personal brand and that's, that I think is a product of this sort of reality TV thing, this idea that everyone has anything, something important to say and should have the right to say it which I think is, I think there were people 10 years ago saying, why are these people famous? And you know what, I think those people were right. I don't, I don't think we should say that everyone who's a naysayer about change is always, is always wrong. I, I, I think there's a different analogy, and I think with social I think media, fair. I think it's the meaninglessness of it. It's the vapid. But my point of a personal brand is that like, not everybody needs to become Lady Gaga and have like little monsters. I mean, it's kind of cool to have like seven people that think, you know, you can be the, if it makes you happy to be the expert of the New York Jets offensive line because you know what Brandon Moore does and this and that. I mean, and there's seven people that actually give a crap about that. It's kind of a nice little thing. You know, the, the, the talk that I gave that probably started bringing most attention to me it was a, a Web 2.0 talk in 2008 and I was just in a rant and I'm like, and if you love the Smurfs, Smurf it up. And now, you know, I'm getting eight million emails a day right now because 
there's a Smurf app that's number one on the iPhone. They're like, yeah, see, you were you right there. You know, be, be, you know, here's my thing. The guy who was working a job because he was paying his college loans and he had to take care of his family because he had to, you know, 20 years ago, didn't have the opportunity to come home and talk and build something virtually by leveraging some of these tools. He just didn't have the option. He got home at 7.30, wanted to spend some time with the kids, probably wanted to have dinner with his wife, and at 9 p.m., his alternatives were, you know, watch television. Or, you know, to me, the fact that he can jump on a computer and build something for him or herself is a big factor. It is a big, big opportunity. It's a, it's a practical way to live the dream in a way that, here's what I like, it's kind of hard to hide a little bit more than it used to be. And that I really enjoy. The first kind of level of internet that I dealt with, people would come around and troll and spam mm-hmm. and there was mm-hmm. really small repercussions, people were faking it. I love what Facebook's doing with identity because all of a sudden the shadows of the internet are changing quite a bit. And guess what? Things like chat roulette where you know there was penis on every second screen, I kept yelling, you know, put <laughs> Facebook Connect on that thing only and a lot of the penises are going to go away. It's amazing what happens when you have to be yourself. How much time did you spend on chat roulette? <laughs> yeah, the penises, I'm roughly. a penis kind of sore because of chat roulette. I mean, that's really how happens. you guys met. Yeah, yeah. that's um, an overheard. You know, yeah. let me. I just want to go back really quick to the idea of living the dream and the social media and that kind of thing. Do you think that Gary's a bit of like an outlier when it comes to living this social media dream, like having built your product and your brand on social media? Would you say he's a bit of an outlier yeah. when? I'd, I'd say he's, I, and, and I think Gary's a genius at what he does, but the trouble, the, the, the problem with that is that people see Gary and think, I could do that too. And the fact is most people can't. I think Gary had, Gary had a, a good business and he realized that social media would help him market, market that. And then like Tony shared Zappos, he's realized that he can now, um, now move on to becoming essentially a motivational speaker. And I think there are people, and Gary's one of them, who are really naturally good at that. Um, I think there is a danger with, with all motivational speakers or anyone who sort of suggests, you know, like you see them sometimes, and I'm certainly not likening you to this, Gary, but you see people on cable TV advertising, you know, like, you can become rich overnight, buy my pack and I'll tell you how. And the guy selling the packs makes a lot of money and becomes very famous, but the people buying the packs don't make any money. And I, I worry that, I think Gary, yes, is an outlier. I think he's great at what he does, but 99.99% of the population will never be Gary Vaynerchuk. But I think people who listen to him all believe they will be. And I think that's the that's the worry for me. Listen, I, I think that you know when he said motivational speaker, I literally almost turned this into WWF. Took my chair and smashed it over his head because that's a scary thing for me. And I understand where he's coming from. And here's my real sad part in this: my DNA creates that persona, right? Because I'm so hyper and over the top and completely. I mean, I think this is the most full glass in the world. That's just <laughs> who I've been in my whole life. I totally respect that and understand that. I really do. At, at the same token. I think it's about the levels, right? I mean, this isn't about, you know, I I agree, I say it all the time. Not everybody's gonna be me because I have certain skill sets and other people have different skill sets, but you can't go away from the fact that there's a lot of singles and doubles being hit because of this. You know, yes, I'm gonna hit a grand slam. I will buy the New York Jets, I'm gonna make billions of dollars, and I'm gonna win, right? But that was going to happen one way or another. What I think social media did was create a playing field that opened up for a lot more singles. Here's what I paint it to. Every person now, at some level, has an at-bat at Yankee Stadium. Do I think most people are gonna hit a home run off of fastball in the major leagues? I definitely do not. The fact that there's seven to 500 people that can, that nobody would have ever known about, is interesting to me. And more importantly, what happens to the thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, that can hit a single or double, who, you know, to me, I'm completely convinced, and I see it, because now that the book's a year old and I'm getting the emails, I want to know the guy or gal who's making $37,000 a year that sits behind Dunkin' Donuts and hates their job. I love the fact that if they come home and don't play Nintendo Wii for nine hours or go drink with their buddies for nine hours, social media is a marketing platform for them to market their content in a way that we've never seen before because the cost of entry is zero. But couldn't they have just started a business before? Couldn't they have become famous before? I mean, we, you, you can't say sure social media's created that. Richard Branson didn't come along because of social 1 million media. Percent. And, you know, but and, the and outliers, any But the outliers are the outliers. What I think is interesting is, listen, here's the fun part. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a businessman. I've made money my whole life. I look at this strictly as business. This is not emotional to me or interesting. I hate technology. How about that? What I like about it is what it does. And what this definitely does, does allow people to market whatever they want to market in a very different way than we've ever seen before, especially from a cost structure. The fact that you can build things with sweat equity and not put in dollars does change the playing field a little bit. It just does.
Well, do you think if you were to put all that effort that he's talking about with social media and using that to kind of you know hit a home run, do you think you could put that effort somewhere else? I mean, what would you? Yeah, it's a valid point. I think you could. I think you could. Uh, yeah, I think there are people who are massively talented in whatever sphere, be it business or singing or acting or whatever else. And those people, I think Barry Diller said this, he's like, I don't believe those people were hiding in closets until, um, <laughs> until uh, the social media came along. I think those people were, uh, those people become famous or become rich or become successful anyway. I think the trouble with social media is it's given this lie, it's created this lie that like reality TV has, that everyone has, and to quote someone else, Conan O'Brien said it, he said on stage not long ago, he said, people, kids come up to him and say, I'm going to be on your show one day, and he says, oh, what do you do? And they say, like, they look at him <laughs> as if that, and it's like, you know, it's just, oh, I'm going to be famous. And, and I think social media is like, I'm going to be rich one day, I'm going to start a business one day, I'm going to be a personal brand. And it's like, oh, cool, what, what's your thing? And they're like, I like Smurfs. And it's like, that's not a thing. You don't get to become successful or famous, I'm sorry, by liking the Smurfs, unless you created the Smurfs. And I, I, that's, what I, that's the thing. It's like, and, you are, and you're not a motivational speaker as a, as a noun, perhaps, but as an adjective, you are. And I think people hear you, and they see you, and they think, I'm motivated to become that guy. But the question is whether they, put, whether they think, so I'm going to work really, really hard. And, I, and I, in your book, you do say work really hard. But the fact is... No, no, I say work your friggin' face off. You do I don't say, say I don't say work hard. I say every hour, every minute. because you're like, a motivational speaker. You know, all, but no, no, but, because that's how businesses are built. Yeah. You're not a motivational speaker, and people are looking at you and saying that's easy. I am a motivational speaker. That's why I say as an adjective rather than as a noun. I don't Fair present myself, and you don't, but we both in our and, different and, weird and ways And that's are. just how people are going to look at it. That's just the way it is with or without social media, with or without promoting, Agreed. with or without speaking, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that think they're going to be... And so know, to suggest that, so, and this is again goes back to the point right. about like, people who say social media has changed everything, it doesn't seem that we've identified all that much here that social media has changed. And yet there are people walking around saying, this is a game changer, this has changed the world, this is revolutionary. And I'm still looking you for the example you, you, of where you know, it has. You don't think it's changed stuff? I think it's changed people's perceptions of how easy Got it is it. to become famous or rich or whatever else, but I, I, or to help charity or to, to become engaged. Like um, Pete Cashmore from Mashable said, you know, attention is the new currency. No currency is the new currency, but but attention's much easier. You know, like you can give your attention, oh, I gave my attention to Darfur, I gave my attention to cancer, I gave my attention to my personal brand. Cool, what, what changed? What did you do? What, what is fixed? And they say, well, attention is the new currency. Like, so just look how much attention I gave to this thing. It's like, or oh, look how much attention I earned. And what does it all mean? And my, my, the reason why I think social media is overrated is no one's given me a good answer to that yet. And I haven't seen anyone who purely using social media ha has made some change that they wouldn't otherwise have made. And that's what, that's my... Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? Is social media is, it, is um, as much of a game changer as people are saying? Yeah. Here's what I know. There's been a lot of little things that have happened. I see them daily with myself, and then I see them with, you know, closer in the circle that I really know, whether it's my wife or my brother or, you know, the 20 people I really know. And then I see it continue to grow on the outlying areas of what I really know, not because CNN's ratings went up or Bravo did this or somebody checked in the Foursquare and, and, you know, they think they're curing cancer, there's a lot of micro changes that are going on because of this. And I think they add up to a lot. We talk about product and, and you mentioned charities and you know people tweeting about charity, people mm -hmm. changing their avatar picture. Do you think that some social media, it, there's that argument that it actually does kind of cheapen what, you know, what the product is? Yeah, I think, well, hmm, I think, it, I think it, may, it fools people into thinking they're doing something when they're not. And I think there are definitely those who would never have done anything and now social media, if they change their avatar green, great. Well done. You've done you've done one you know one percent more than you would have ever done, and you know Glad Malcolm Gladwell wrote a thing in the New Yorker where he found that the average donation given by the the one point whatever million people joined the Save Our Four group was nine cents. Now there are those who say, well, that's nine cents times one point three million that they wouldn't have otherwise had. My worry is it's not. My worry is it's it's actually less than they would have had because there were probably a lot of people in there who would have given more but felt like they'd done something. So I think it doesn't necessarily. Paying, you know, getting attention like as a marketing thing, getting attention for a charity is always good. I worry that it's, it sort of lowers the cost of entry to the point where people just feel like they want to do something and rather than that used to be write a check or give you a credit card number, it's now that and that's it done. What do you, what do you think, Gary? Do you think that you know, having the ability to tweet about something like this or that kind of may prevent us from actually going out there and doing something? Anybody who really gets it understands that it comes down to the individual person. Mm -hmm. I think there's, of those 1.3 million, I'm sure there's a ton of people that would have never done anything and those nine cents make me happy. And again, 
because of my own personal DNA and optimism, I'm gonna always think that that was better. I just yeah. am. I, I can't help it. It's how I filter the world. The, changing your avatar to green is ludicrous if you wanna look at it that way. I'm fascinated by the kid that I had dinner with who's now going to the Middle East and, soon, and literally wants to, you know, is gonna live this there is, for years. This year. is out of the this Out of that. I mean, that's interesting. That's one dude. What right. if that dude goes on to become the guy who makes an impact? You can't discount that. And I think Paul's right when he says that we're gonna see a ton of stuff that is ludicrous. 99% of the people that run around and say they're social media experts are looking to make a quick buck. I firmly, firmly, firmly believe that. 99, not 95. However, What's that 1% gonna do? Right. What happens to people that do have business shops that teach companies to listen and give a crap and recognize there's value in it? I think there's some interesting let's, things Let's get to the big out. picture. Uh, Paul, three years from now, will social media be as important as it is to us today? Sure, I imagine it will, again, it's like reality TV. I assume it'll only get bigger. It sells people a dream. It's incredibly seductive. Um, you will be famous, you will be rich. People will pay attention to you. you can, of course it'll be bigger. It'll be bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, will it get more valuable, you think, as? No. Uh, I, I mean, not not for those reasons, not to those things. I don't think it will make anyone any richer, apart from Mark Zuckerberg. I don't think it'll make, or you know, Evan Williams. I don't think it'll make anyone more famous. I think it might have the reverse effect of diluting what it means to be famous to the point where everyone will be, which means no one is. Um, no, I think it's. I think if you, you you're smart to invest in social media, I think you're dumb if you're a marketer if you're not using social media. Is it going to change the world and make it a better place or a richer place or a more successful place? No. Thank you. You know, I think we agree on most things until the end. I, you know, I feel like I feel like it does make it better for people that you know. I, I honestly, I view this pretty simplistic. Here's what social does, and nothing else. It takes these lights and puts spots lights on our society. It just does. And you know what? When more people are watching, the only thing that happens is the same old thing that they said about fame. And you're right; it's going to do it. Can I just fame. very quickly refute that? Because yeah. that is actually something that's quite important and, and dangerous. I agree. I agree with you that. Like, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, all that, yep. all that jazz. However, it's also really, really easy now to completely ruin somebody's life with a lie. And I disagree. N well, I. Because you can rebuttal it very you, easily. No, you can't. Why not? Uh, because, uh, well, I mean. Why not? Because, as a matter of fact, the media used to come out how, and say something, long and the CEO of a for... company couldn't rebuttal it no. if nobody how, wanted how to talk to How long did it take now for... Now we go on YouTube. Wait. And go ahead. No, because it's, an, it's, an, it's, an, it's too much noise, and it becomes opinions. It becomes... Oh, well, too much noise. Oh, Obama. Itself, uh, no, it becomes Obama itself. said that the, well, the trip to India didn't cost two hundred million. But but all these people do say oh, it's opinion. If there's too much it's noise, not. why can the lie itself not have you know get more attention than the rebuttal because itself? Because if the lie is seductive enough and the lie is sordid enough, then that's much more interesting than somebody, you, somebody saying. I promise you, somebody tries to smear the shit out of me, that I will fully use social 24/7, 365 to rebuttal it. And I but think people trust work. you. People people come to it with an idea of what Gary Vaynerchuk is. They trust me because I. And, and but if you way, become known as the guy who was accused of a crime on Twitter and that's all people know of you, good luck rebutting it because you're that guy. I, I truly don't believe that the lie can win and I firmly believe that this exposes, it's like fame. Fame only accentuates who you are. There's people that became famous and became much better people because they were good to begin with and there's people who became famous and became jerk offs because that's who they were in the first place. I view social in a lot of the same ways and I do think Paul's right. I think the, 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 you know, the quality or the value of fame does dilute. It spreads out this kind of centralizes things in a way, but I think it works the same way. All right, well guys, thanks for coming, thank sharing you. your thanks thoughts. For Never thanks. a dull moment when it's, when it's Gary Vaynerchuk and Paul Carr. So you guys, thank Brando you very much. And Batman. That's right. <laughs> All right, thanks cool. guys. Thanks.